So I'm really excited to be here with Dr. Amy Killen today, who specializing, specializes in anti-aging and regenerative medicine, in particular, sexual health, hormones, and the skin. I've got so much to talk to you about today, Amy. Um, welcome to the show, and thank you for coming on. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Um, I guess my first question is, um, I've been uh, looking at some of your recent talks and things, is you make the point that sex is not just fun, but it's also amazing for longevity and for our yes. long-term health. Can you explain a bit more about that? Absolutely. So, uh, you know, having an active or healthy sex life has been shown to positively affect multiple different parts of your life and to and your longevity and your health. Uh, so, for instance, we know that people who have active, healthy sex lives are, are less likely to have depression or anxiety. They have generally have better self-esteem, which all, you know, goes towards better mental health. Um, there's actually quite a few studies have actually showed at least a correlation between an active, healthy sex life and lower, uh, lower blood pressure, lower risk of heart disease, uh, lower, you know, better sleeping, lower stress, and even in some men, at least, uh, lower all-cause mortality. So they, they, they had less, you know, lower risk of dying over a 10-year period compared to men who are not sexually active. Um, so there are a number of different positive things that, that sex can do for you. Uh, and I think that we don't talk about it enough. So that's kind of one of my goals. Yeah, for sure. I completely agree with that. I, th I think I um, saw something you put out actually about the fact that men who have sex twice a week have a 50% lower death rate than men who have sex once a month. That's right. Yeah, that was a study that was that was done, and that, you know, it's it's looking at a large was looking at a large group of men over a ten year time period, and that's what they found. And you know, there may be several different things that are that are in there. You know, for instance, men who are having sex more often may be generally more healthy uh, because if they're able to still have sex and, ha and get erections, then maybe they have better better uh, general health and blood flow and such. But they did try to um, to equalize the study, and you know, things like diabetes and heart disease and things like that. They they made sure that they accounted for it on both sides. So, you know, even with that equalization, they still found that men who were sexually active um, were, were less likely to die over ten, a 10 year period. Interesting. And what about in terms of testosterone? Is there kind of an optimal number of times that men should be having sex? Because I know that um, if you have it too often, right, then you're almost depleting resources. Um, yeah, I mean, sex itself can increase testosterone. That's one of the many things that, that you can actually do to help increase testosterone. I, I know a lot of people talk about having, you know, about wanting to kind of conserve your ejaculations and things like that. And, and maybe there's some, some science behind that. But for the most part, you know, at least a few times a week is probably ideal. For, for having sex, whether that's, you know, whether you're alone or with someone else, like the, the data actually, even if you're just by yourself, uh, is, is still positive, still kind of getting the juices flowing, if you will, seems okay. to have a lot of benefits. And there are a lot of hormonal benefits to orgasm for both men and women, you know, changes in the brain, dopamine changes, improvements in memory, uh, changes in the hippocampus in the back of the, main, at the back of the brain. So there's quite a bit of data that even if you're alone and don't have a partner, that, that being sexually active is actually a positive thing. Interesting. Okay. So it's even good for the brain. It's great. Yeah, yeah, it is. In fact, they've done studies in elderly uh, people and they've seen that elderly people who you know, are having sex at least once a week are less likely to have cognitive decline. So, you know, they're less likely to have memory problems um, compared to their, their friends who are not sexually active. Wow. Wow. So it's very health protective. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess the other thing I wanted to talk to you about on that is, um, you, well, you make the point that, right, that people should be able to have sex right on into their 70s and their 80s. It's not just something for the younger generation. Um, yes. And that, you know, we know that people encounter problems. And I think you also make the point that 40% of men, am I right, correct me if I'm wrong, over the age of 40 will have some form of sexual dysfunction and around that same percentage in women at some point in their lifetime. Yes, uh, yes. It's pretty, I mean, that's almost half of all people, right? So... Yeah, it's pretty crazy. You know, with men, certainly as they get older, they're going to have, they're going to be more likely to have erectile dysfunction or other similar sexual dysfunctions. But yeah, starting at about age 40, up to 40% of men will have, you know, some degree of ED. It may not be that they're having problems every time, but they're, problem, they're having problems sometime or things become less reliable. Um, so they're starting to, you know, kind of get a little bit nervous about it. Um, and, and in women, uh, same thing, about 40% of women at some point, you know, they complain of sexual dysfunction. And for women, it can be anything from lack of libido, 
lacking or lack of desire. It could be problems with arousal, not getting aroused properly, orgasmic problems, or even pain. So all those four things are kind of all what's considered sexual dysfunction for women. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of people, almost half of women uh, at some point complain of those things. Mm. And is this more around the time of the menopause when kind of hormone levels are dropping off? Is that when women tend to encounter these issues? Um, yeah, more after menopause, but certainly uh, I see patients in, you know, even way, many, many years before menopause, in about the 10 years before actual menopause sets in, you have this perimenopause state where you start to see these hormone fluctuations where your progesterone levels start to kind of be a little bit lower and your, your hormones are going a little bit crazy. Um, and so we have a lot of, you know, a lot of women will have general different, all, all kinds of symptoms during that time. Um, and, and sexual problems uh, or lack of interest in sex is one of them. Um, testosterone also tends to start to go down in that, you know, 10 or so years before menopause. So I have women, you know, 30, 35, uh, who are pretty healthy otherwise. But if I ask them, you know, how's your sex life or how's your sexual desire? They're like, what sexual desire? Like, you know, that's almost always the answer I get. Like whenever I ask how their, their libido is, they're always, they always say, I don't have one. Um, and that's so common in women just in general, but especially as they get a little bit older. Yeah. Yeah. I noticed that actually. And also, from, from speaking to women also once they've had children somehow that seems to make it's bizarre isn't it but it's almost yeah. like I mean you find you spend kind of the first part of your life doing your best to never fall pregnant and then right. <laughs> maybe this was a bit harder than I thought <laughs> right and then you do have kids and then a lot of women yeah I hear you know do kind of really go go off it a bit um yeah yeah I think it's probably a lot of different things. You know, certainly you have hormonal changes. You got, you're also tired and you've got, you know, you're not sleeping. You've got your kids, you're busier. Um, and maybe there's some sort of evolutionary thing too, where your body is like, all right, did my job. Like we don't have to do it again. <laughs> but, <laughs> but having said that, you know, I have a lot of patients and I know a lot of people who are, you know, in their sixties and seventies and, and, and even older who have very active, healthy sex lives. And, you know, they tend to work hard at it and keep themselves healthy. And they work on their you know, mind, body health, and they do some of the other, other things I talk about to improve sexual function. Um, but it's definitely possible if it's something that people actually want. If they want. And you have, can you talk us through, because I know you have your six super sexy scientific principles for <laughs> and enjoyable sex life. I love how, how much research you've done. I feel like you know more about me than I know. <laughs> I was watching oh, your Mind Valley presentation. I think. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, that's, that's, that's super sexy, one. super simple. Um, yeah, so I talk about uh, about six different things that, that people can do to help maintain uh, sexual vitality and sexual optimization. So the first one, which may not be in the Mind Valley talk, is uh, my, I say mind your mind, which is basically, you know, uh, for all of us, our biggest sex organ is actually our brain. So mm -hmm. making sure that we're in the, my, the right place mentally, making sure that we're, our stress is under control, making sure that we're actually leaving time for, uh, for things like, for, like relaxing and meditating and, and all of that's actually really important because uh, from, a, from a physiologic standpoint, uh, we are designed to have sex when we are at sort of at peace and at rest and not super stressed out, uh, which makes sense. Like if you're, you know, from old man sort of caveman days, if you're being chased by a tiger and you're actually running through the forest and you're super stressed out and your sympathetic nervous system is way up and your epinephrine and your adrenaline and all of it's cranked up, um, you're not also thinking about having sex with your partner. Like you're thinking about surviving. Yeah. And I feel like a lot of us right now um, in this sort of day and age, we're all kind of in this survival mode, you know, a good part of the time. And, and when that's happening, when all you're thinking about is surviving, um, it's a lot harder to then transition into being able to have sex in a, in a positive and sort of meaningful way. So that's the first thing is really just focusing on mental health and being in a good place uh, so that you're, you're ready to have sex. <laughs> um, and then the second one is, is about taking care of your body. And this is something that, you know, seems very intuitive, but if you think about the fact that the, the sexual organs, uh, they need a lot of blood flow in order to work properly. And that goes for both men with their erections as well as for women for things like vaginal lubrication and clitoral engorgement. You actually need a rush of blood, you know, going into that area and staying in that area. And so if you don't have clean arteries and a good cardiovascular system. Um, if you've been, you know, eating on sugar for many years, if you've had a, you know, if you've been leading a sedentary lifestyle, if you've been smoking, if you have high blood pressure, you know, all the things that we know that are bad for our cardiovascular health, those things are also bad for our sexual health because you need the blood flow to make those organs work. So, you know, taking a step back and just taking general 
care of yourself is actually really important for having, you know, properly working sexual organs. So and on that one, you, um, yeah. I just wanted, because you said something really interesting, actually, when I was watching one of your talks about, cause, so this is to do with nitric oxide production, right? Mm -hmm. Which helps yeah. produced by the endothelial cells. But I think you made a link between um, mouth bacteria and yeah. using mouthwash. And this was really interesting to me because yeah. I wanted to know more about that because that's probably something that people are really surprised. I mean, I was surprised by that. Yeah, so that's a that's a great question. So the third sort of third sort of part of my sort of simple tricks is to increase and maintain your nitric oxide levels, which is what you're talking about. Um, so nitric oxide is this chemical hormone that we all make, we've all made for our whole lives. And one of the things it does is it vasodilates or opens up your blood vessels. So they're kind of small, and then it it opens them up so the blood can go in. Um, so that's one of its key things. But what ends up happening after the age of about 40 is you're just making less and less nitric oxide in your blood vessels every year. So even like a you know 40 year old, for instance, has half as much nitric oxide as a 20 year old. Um, and that number gets worse and worse as you get older. And so, so for instance, so this is a big part of why older men can't get erections because they don't actually have enough nitric oxide to vasodilate, to open the blood vessels up down in their, in their penis and their pelvis to get the blood in. So nitric oxide comes from two different sort of two different pathways. One of them is that it can be made inside your blood vessels, um, which is what happens for most of us, especially when you're younger. But as you get older, the cells that line the blood vessels, the endothelial cells, like you were mentioning, they become less functional. And this is again, having to do with inflammation uh, associated, associated changes. So they're not functioning as well. So they can't make the nitric oxide, but you can get it from other sources. You can get it from food, for instance. So foods that are high in nitrates, which are things like green leafy vegetables, you know, spinach, arugula, kale, uh, beets are very high in nitrates, um, even like dark chocolate, pomegranate. There's, you know, there's a lot of things that have nitrates in them. Um, but if you eat nitrates, then you're at, your body can actually convert the nitrates in food into the nitric oxide. Okay. But the first, the first step of that pathway happens in your mouth. So there are bacteria in your mouth that live there at the back of your tongue, and their job is to start that whole conversion process. So they actually take the nitrates in food and they break it down into nitrite, which is the first step. Um, and we can't do that on our own. You have to have the bacteria in your mouth to do that. And so what happens is a lot of people, like I think it's like 60 you know, million Americans use uh, antiseptic mouthwash like Listerine and these sort of bacteria killing mouthwashes. Um, but as you, as you would imagine, if they're killing the bacteria in your mouth, the good bacteria, if you will, um, then you're wiping out your body's ability to actually begin that first step to make nitric oxide. So there's actually a direct tie-in between uh, people who use mouthwash regularly, antiseptic mouthwash, and things like diabetes and high blood pressure, those both go up in, in, in heavy mouthwash users, and it's all because of nitric oxide. And by the same token, at least it makes sense that, uh, the, you know, that erectile dysfunction would be higher in those groups um, and sexual dysfunction. So that's really important is don't use, the, you know, if you're going to use mouthwash, use something that's not actually going to kill the bacteria. You can sort of make your own, you know, do it yourself kind of mouthwash, um, or you can just use it occasionally, but using it more than once or twice a week can be a problem. Can be a lot. And what about, so it's not the fluoride, it's the antiseptic stuff that's in the mouthwash so using a fluoride based toothpaste i know some people you know do go very naturally anyway but just to clarify it's not the fluoride that's doing it um, it's not the fluoride it's uh, you know, fluoride can cause its own problems you know that can it can interfere with testosterone production and interfere with thyroid and some of the other hormones that are out there if you get if you are swallowing a lot of it um but the fluoride is not what's causing the problems with nitric oxide that's actually the alcohols and the things that are actually killing the bacteria in your mouth Okay, interesting. And so if people then stop using it, can they recover this bacteria in their mouth again? Or do they have to take steps through probiotics, etc, to, to get it back? Yeah, great question. So they can recover it. If you eat the foods that are high in nitrates, uh, you actually can rebuild that supply of these nitrate reducing bacteria in your mouth, your body, you know, your body is so smart, it just, it just knows to like recruit those bacteria to come in to be able to, to make this food um, work. Uh, there are some, uh, I have seen some oral probiotics that are out there that, that potentially could be effective. And uh, there are also, there's a, some, me, some medications or supplements that, that I, I've used with patients that can also be helpful in re, kind of regaining this pathway. But I think that, you know, the easiest and the cheapest way to do it is just ditch the mouthwash and then really pile on those nitrate rich foods like the green leafy vegetables and the beets and things like that.
Brilliant. Thank you. Okay. So that's tip number three. Um, yep. That's good. Okay. Uh, the other things I was going to mention that you can do to increase nitric oxide are exercise, which is, you know, very simple. That's going to increase your production of exercise, uh, red light therapy, and which has become really, you know, big in the biohacking kind of space can also increase nitric oxide. So there are a lot of other things you can do uh, besides get it from food, but food is also a great source. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, so we have nitric oxide, looking after your mind, looking after your body, um, exercise, and then yep. number four. And then number four is optimizing hormones. And that's different for every person. But basically, you know, as we get older, obviously hormones are changing. And one of the things that happens as hormones change is you lose, uh, you know, as you lose testosterone, whether you're a woman or a man, for instance, maybe your sex drive goes down, your libido goes down. Uh, testosterone for men is also important in actually being able to have an erection. So as men get older, you know, after age 40 or so, testosterone levels start to go down every year. And you're going to have a harder time potentially having an erection and maintaining that, as well as just less interest in sex. Um, and same thing for women. You know, as we get older, we, we have lower, lower levels of progesterone and testosterone. And then eventually after menopause, lower levels of estrogen. And estrogen is really important for keeping the, the vaginal area healthy. So it keeps the tissues healthy um, and prevents them from kind of you know, thinning out and drying out and becoming uh, sort of these painful uh, areas. So keeping those hormones up and sort of in that optimal range can be really important. And, and certainly you have to work with a doctor on this uh, to see if you're a good candidate for hormone replacement therapy. Um, or you can also do certain things with lifestyle to help increase you know, testosterone, like weightlifting and, and making sure you're getting enough amino acids and making sure you're getting enough sunlight and you know, things like that. So there are lifestyle changes you can make to try to optimize hormones um, as well as working with a physician uh, to see if maybe you need to have some supplemental hormones added in to help keep those tissues nice and healthy. And so for women, would that be things like bioidentical hormones that you would suggest? Yeah, that's, that's what I do. I do a lot of bioidentical hormones. I don't use the, um, the non-bioidenticals like the progestins, which are, which are sort of these synthetic uh, progesterones that are, that have actually been shown to increase your risk for heart disease and stroke and, and, and breast cancer and all these things. So I use bioidentical estrogen, progesterone, testosterone for women and the same testosterone for men. Um, and you know, everyone's different. Not everyone's a good candidate, but, but even if you don't take them systemically, like as pills or trophies or shots, uh, you can sometimes do even local hormones. Like for instance, for women, I have a lot of patients who can't take estrogen um, as a pill or systemically because of breast cancer or other things. Um, but we can do estrogen creams like vaginal estrogen creams. So you can actually still keep the the vaginal tissues healthy and help to kind of support the, the pelvic floor without exposing the body to the estrogen that might otherwise be dangerous for that person. Uh, but for most people, uh, taking systemic estrogen is, is generally not going to be a problem, but obviously everyone's different. Mm -hmm. Sure. So they need to consult a doctor on that. Um, yes. <laughs> and for women, so we have kind of obviously stages, right? They're, as you were saying, progesterone and testosterone start to decline. And then as they approach the menopause, estrogen is going down. Is this something that they should be thinking about on a preemptive basis as they're kind of going through the perimenopause? Or do you see women on a symptomatic basis? Like how would, how would I know as I'm getting older that I now need to, apart from unless I've actually stopped having menstrual cycles, how would I right. know that I need to be doing this? Yeah, but usually it's symptomatic. I mean, usually women are going to have uh, a, a whole slew of different symptoms. You know, it could be anything from foggy brain to difficulty sleeping. Um, certainly night flashes and hot, you know, night sweats and hot flashes are common, but it could be other things. It could be just irritability. It could be, uh, you know, a lot of cramping before your periods or irregular periods, um, weight gain. There's, you know, there's a whole list of things mm -hmm. that can happen when your hormones start changing. Um, what I would encourage women to do is, is just, you know, A, establish care with the doctor, you know, that you're seeing occasionally and getting, you know, getting occasional blood work and such. So you kind of know where you are, where your baseline is right now. So that as things start to change and as you, as you start to have symptoms, you can recheck blood, blood, blood tests or urine or saliva or whatever. And you'll see those changes because you already know what your baseline is. So even though you don't have to go to the doctor all the time, at least get some baseline labs done when you're feeling good. And then as you start having changes, you'll, you'll be able to detect those more easily. And then you'll know kind of how to treat those a little bit better. Yeah, sure. So that's a really key point you make there is have the blood work done first when you're feeling good. So you have something to look back on and compare. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. I guess it's different in everyone, right? 
Yes, that's and, and women women's hormones are especially difficult because they're going up and down during the month so much that you know if you check your hormones on day five of your cycle versus day ten or twenty one, they're going to be they're going to be completely different. So you do have to check. Uh, in general, in women, we ask, we recommend checking their hormones at about day twenty one of their cycle. So if your period starts on day one then you count 21 days after your period uh, began. And that's about when you want to have your labs drawn uh, just for consistency purposes. And then the next time you have it drawn, you know, a few years from now or whatever, have it on the same day. Uh, because if you don't, you're going to get such big variations in numbers that you're going to think that something is wrong when it's probably not. <laughs> yeah. 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 That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Um, okay. So then looking after hormonal health, and then there are some additional, I think these are more in-clinic therapies that you would recommend. There's the O-shot and the P-shot. Right. Um, right. right. Can you talk yes. us through those? So the O-shot and the P-shot are both uh, just injections that, you, that a doctor would do. Uh, O-shot is for women, it stands for orgasm shot, and the P-shot is for men, it stands for priapus shot. Um, and these were traditionally done just with PRP, which is platelet-rich plasma, uh, which basically is I take some blood from you as the patient, I centrifuge it, spin it, and I get the platelets and I concentrate them. So I have about six to nine times more platelets than you would like in your regular, in your whole blood. And that's what's called PRP. And that PRP, which of course has been around for 30 30 plus years, well studied. We use it for everything from treating knee pain to, you know, helping heal skin wounds. Um, that can be injected into the uh, the various sexual organs. So for women with the O shot, we inject into the clitoris um, after we numb it with some numbing cream because that would hurt. <laughs> All the women are they always cringe whenever I say that. Um, and, and we also crossing their legs when you mention. I know exactly. <laughs> Whenever I give a talk and I, and I talk about this, I look at the, out at the audience when I say this and they all are just like, ah, like they always have like, oh, this awful look. Um, so we did the clitoris and then also the anterior vaginal wall, which is kind of like where the G spot is, um, where that, that sort of, t you know, bundle of, of nerve tissue is. So we inject those two areas with the PRP. Uh, for men, we do the P shot, which is basically injecting a couple of different spots in the penis, uh, the corpus cavernosum, which are the tubes that fill with blood when you have an erection, inject into those two tubes, as well as the corona, which is at the tip. Um, and you can do the P, -hot, P shot with just PRP, or depending on where you live, uh, you might be able to get it get it with other things like stem cells or exosomes or amniotic tissue or things like that. But, but PRP is uh, by itself is generally well accepted pretty much anywhere in the world as, as you, can, you could use you know, all over the body. And does that, that obviously has the effect of getting better orgasms, better or longer erections, but also does that um, help to kind of get libido back, stimulate desire if people are finding that their libido has been dropping off? Um, it, I have I have heard reports of, of certainly with women especially uh, that it, it, it sometimes helps with that, but the mechanism of action really is is mostly staying in the sexual organs. So as you're increasing blood flow into those areas, you potentially are increasing nerve regeneration, you know, collagen production in women, um, things like that. So you're essentially uh, making the sexual organs work better. Now, if they work better and things feel better, then it makes sense that that would feed back to your brain to say, hey, this is actually more fun than it used to be. Let's do that again, and then you could have this you know positive feedback loop uh, kind of thing but i don't know that these these therapies you know are going to directly affect your brain although i have seen actually in some stem cell research that even just doing some vaginal injections uh with stem cells ended up creating hormonal changes essentially um, reversing um, menopause and rat studies and things like that like changing the hormones at the level of the brain just by injecting the, the vagina which was really interesting that and those are animal studies uh, but but it you know it's possible but right now i would say it's mostly local local effects and that was sorry that was reversing menopause or that's pretty amazing right yeah yeah and it was a rat study and it was fascinating because they just injected just like the external sort of vulva vagina areas um, with these stem cells. And they found that they, then they measured hormones like estrogen, which these are like postmenopausal rats, you know, that have been put through menopause. And then they would do these injections and then they measured um, estrogen and, um, and some of the other hormones like FSH and LH, the, the pituitary and other hormones. And they essentially got those rats back into a pre-menopause state from a hormonal standpoint um, just by doing these vaginal injections uh, so you know the body is so closely tied together it's 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 surprising and also not uh but but very interesting i think very interesting it actually that sort of leads me onto a question that i've had in my mind because i know you know um dr david sinclair and uh -huh. I was reading his book lifespan 
And a question I've had in my head is if we really can delay aging or even reverse it, then in theory, what we should be able to do is at least delay menopause in women. Um, yeah, yeah. Think any research around that because ultimately, right, every risk goes up, doesn't it? Heart disease risk goes up for women post-menopause. You know, there's so many things, bone density. Um, yes. I think it's possible to actually, are we there yet or getting close to actually reversing and, and delaying menopause in women, do you think? I think it's certainly possible. I don't think we're, we're quite there yet. Um, I mean, there are a couple of some other studies, uh, again, using stem cells and regenerative medicine where they actually inject the, like inject the ovaries uh, specifically or inject, you know, inject the actual um, sexual organs in the pelvis that they've been able to reverse menopause uh, and actually take people who are postmenopausal women uh, and, and get them to start ovulating again, even get them pregnant again. I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on in the stem cell space. Uh, yeah, I love David Sinclair's book. I feel like I, I feel like I think about it or talk about it like at least once a day. <laughs> Um, but you know, it totally makes sense that if we can use, you know, all of these different medications and drugs and supplements and lifestyle changes that if we're actually aging slower, that things like menopause would, would happen later on and that we'd stay healthier in this, in this range a lot longer, but I don't know for sure, but I think it's possible. Amazing. Um, and then I think there's also, before we move away from sex onto skin, because that's a massive topic for me, one of my favorites, um, there's something about sound was it a vibration therapy that you can also use kind of yeah so, so that's so the sixth kind of category of things that i do for sex is uh the use the use of sound and light and heat so that's kind of a big category but uh, for instance for men there's uh, shockwave therapy which is it's also called low intensity extracorporeal shockwave therapy super long name but well studied for at least 10 years uh for treating uh, erectile dysfunction in men. And basically it uses these high intensity sound waves. It's an in-office procedure generally, although some people can do it at home. Um, but it's a machine that you just, you just essentially apply it to the penis, sends these sound waves into the penis. It's like a 20 minute session. Um, and the sound waves actually end up triggering this whole biologic cascade, which ends up increasing blood vessel formation and blood flow, nitric oxide production in the penis, which as we know is really important, um, and even stem cell recruitment to essentially regenerate that tissue. So, uh, so you, you essentially do a series of like six or 12 of these these sessions with shockwave therapy um, and and then you know you actually I, I have many men who've had return of function return of you know of uh, erectile function or improvements in function I have young men who, who don't really have a lot of problems but they just they've done it and they've seen improvements in sensitivity and they can last longer and things like that um, and then the other other things you know in women there's quite a number of vaginal lasers and radio frequency devices and things like that that you can do at your doctor's offices that can help kind of restore the the the, uh, the normal mucosa of the vagina, um, as well as some take-home devices. That devices. Some, some of my favorites are actually uh, devices that women can use at home. They just, you know, you buy it, use it at home, and um, uses like red light therapy, for instance. So there's an intravaginal red light therapy device uh, that's out there that's called a V-Fit Plus or V-Fit, and it's basically an at-home device. It's, you know, it's 12 minutes. You, you put it in. It's kind of like a, I call it like a circus for your vagina. Like <laughs> it doesn't, it does it's very warm. It's like a warm, like a hot stone massage and you just sit there and basically it's red light therapy inside your vagina and you're essentially helping to restore those those uh, the vaginal wall as well as some of the pelvic floor so it can help with things like stress urinary incontinence you know when wow. you kind of when you have like you jump on a trampoline and you kind of pee a little bit um, and also improve uh, vaginal lubrication tightness sensitivity all that and that's an at home you know 12 minutes three nice. times a week kind of thing so there are some things like that that are actually out there now that um, some of which are more expensive, some of which are not, but that can help restore function even in people who don't have, you know, who've lost it. Um, if, and if you do all of these things together, all kind of six of these different mm. things, I've seen, you know, people can really turn around um, their, their, their sexual health and it can make huge differences in their relationships and, and as well as just the way they feel about themselves and, you know, the world around them. Yeah, for sure. That's amazing. And so the VFIT um, Plus, that's something people would do at home. Uh, for for mm -hmm. men, in terms of the shockwave therapy, is that an in-clinic thing or is there a device that they can use as well? It's generally in clinic because the devices are pretty expensive. The ones that work are expensive. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the cheapest at-home model that I've seen that actually works is about $10,000. So okay. it's not super yeah. inexpensive. Um, but, you know, I think that with, like with anything else, we'll start to see less expensive options that actually work in the next few years that people could have at home. Um, because, you know, obviously it, it, it's, it makes sense that if you could do these sessions at home kind of regularly uh, to continue to have improvement in blood flow and blood vessel formation and things like that, 
it would just kind of be a, a you know a home maintenance you do just like you go to the gym occasionally maybe you do your your you know shockwave therapy occasionally and then you do your v fit occasionally you know like all of these things uh it makes sense you do it on a, as an ongoing basis uh, but right now most people are doing shockwave therapy at their doctor's offices amazing very very interesting thank you for that um Talking about, I think red light, this is a, this is a good segue actually yeah. into the skin and the hair. Because this is a thing that I know causes, not just for men, right? Men often lose their hair, but women increasingly do. Um, and, it's, and it's particularly kind of upsetting for them. And it happens more and more as they get on in life. Um, and I know that red light and um, near infrared light is um, things that you've spoken about that can really help both with skin and hair. Can you kind of elaborate on that? I, I actually saw a post yeah. with you on Instagram, I believe, where you had an infrared cap uh, uh -huh. wearing. Um, so yeah, can you share a bit more about that? Yeah, so red light therapy in general, the way that it works is it basically um, causes your mitochondria, you know, inside your cells, the energy kind of engines of your cells, it causes them to be able to make more energy, to make more ATP. So it increases ATP production in your mitochondria. Um, and so it, it can be useful for all different things. And, uh, but one of the things, the things that I use it for are uh, for skin and hair, like you mentioned, as well as the female sexual function. Um, in skin, you know, you're basically putting a light over the face and there are different ways you can do this either in doctor's offices, they have usually kind of high powered lights, or there are a number of home home models now where you have those like Freddy Krueger, was it Freddy Krueger with the white light, like the white, um, <laughs> the, the nightmare on Elm Street, like it's old school, but like the white mask that you have on your face, um, with the hockey mask that, that have the light therapy. So there are a lot of those you can get that are at home and you can do these things at home, but essentially can increase the, um, the health of your skin. So general things like improving the texture and the tone and, and kind of the brightness of your skin over time. Um, I do, one of my favorite things to do as sort of a health maintenance is uh, I do a, I have a red light therapy that I use it for my face and I just lay on my bed. It's kind of like my meditation. I lay on my bed. I turn this on. It's like 20 minutes. I put on like some, you know, waterfall sounds. It's like nice and warm. It feels good. And I just like do like a sort of a lying down meditation with my, with my face mask. And, you know, I don't know if it, if it's actually helping me, but it's one of those things that I love doing it because it makes me feel really good. Um, but definitely for hair, there's quite a bit of actually of studies in hair as well that show that red light therapy is uh, effective in helping to decrease, to decrease hair loss and actually also stimulate hair growth. Uh, and it's one of those things that, you know, when I'm treating someone for hair loss, whether it's man or woman, I always send them home or recommend like one of the red light therapy caps that they wear um, usually about every other day. You wear it for about 30, you know, 30 minutes or so, depending on the brand, um, but it can make a huge difference in addition to some of the other tools that we have. So with that red light, does that need to be in the form of a cap or a mask? So like I have a red light at home, for example, that I would sit or stand in front of. Um, would that not be close enough to cause the effects, for example, on hair growth? Does it have to be directly onto the scalp to get the benefits? It has to be able to get to the scalp. So, you know, like it, it, it's even with caps, if you have someone who has actually a lot of hair, because I have a lot of women who they actually have a fair amount of hair, they just want more. And so, you know, if you, if you put a cap on them or do a juve or something else, red light therapy, um, if, the, if the light can't actually get to the scalp, then it's not going to work as well. So, so it makes sense that certainly you, if you're more bald and you can get the, scalp, the light to your scalp, it will work better. As far as how close you have to be, it really depends on the light itself, how strong it is, um, you know, certainly some lights, like you could stand, you know, a foot away and you're still getting the benefits of it versus some light, they really need to be right on your, you know, right against, not, not touching necessarily, but within a centimeter or two of your, of your face or your scalp because they're not quite as strong. Um, so it really depends on the light itself. Yeah, sure. Okay. On the strength of it. And um, PRP is also very good, is it not, for uh, hair growth? It is. Yeah. PRP is great for skin and hair, um, which is kind of how I got into all of this. I started doing PRP uh, for skin and hair and sexual function. And I became so interested in that that I started learning about all the other things that I could do for skin and hair and sexual function. And all of a sudden it was, you know, Dr. Keller who does skin and sex, which is a weird kind of weird combination. Um, but, but the tools that we use for skin and sex are actually very similar. You know, you have the light therapy, you have the PRP, you have the stem cells, you have the diet and you know, exercise and all that. The hormones um, are also important for skin and hair. Um, so, so yeah, so PRP, you, we can inject it in the face. We can um, inject it into the scalp for hair. We can do like microneedling where you just do like a little, little tiny device that makes little bitty, uh, 
it'll needle, needle pokes and you just apply it topically. So there's all different ways to use PRP to help keep the skin healthy and then to kind of re-trigger the hair to get into that active growth phase. Okay, interesting. And even the microneedling itself, I think, stimulates collagen production, doesn't it? it even with yeah, that. absolutely. Yeah, yeah, they call it they call it collagen induction therapy. So even by itself, or even with just water, you're going to have improvements in skin if you do microneedling. So you know, one of my favorite at home tricks for people is uh, to do either a cheap microneedling device or or a derma roller, as long as you're cleaning it properly, uh, where you're you know once or twice a week just go over your your face or your neck um, with these uh, with these needles, and and then you can apply your favorite serums and and vitamin C's and hyaluronic acids and things like that. Uh, but just causing a little bit of micro trauma. Uh, if you do it in a safe way, that's clean needles, et cetera, it can be really helpful to keep your skin sort of in that continued regeneration phase. Yeah, that's something I do actually. I, I use a, a derma roller at home. Um, is that, so you mentioned only once or twice a week. Um, is, it, is it too much? I mean, I don't do it every day, but I know some people kind of get carried away. Um, I definitely don't recommend doing it in the morning because obviously you're skin barriers weaker and with sunlight and stuff it's not a good idea mm -hmm. but what would you say is optimal in terms of doing that at home it depends on how deep your needles are i mean if you have pretty superficial needles like 0.2 millimeters or something like that then you could probably do it a few times a week and it wouldn't be a problem i, I wouldn't do it every day probably your skin does need some time to rest you know just like you would do the same workout every single day because your body needs some time to rest and adjust but um, if you're doing it a little bit deeper like for instance i generally do uh 0.5 uh, millimeters then, then that's something I try to do once or twice a week but, and definitely wouldn't do it every day. That causes my skin to be pretty red, uh, you know, a little swollen afterwards for 30 minutes or so. Um, and certainly if you're doing even deeper than that, which is when you go to the doctor and you get numbed up uh, and you're doing something like one and a half to two millimeters, then, then that's something that's more like once a month maximum. So it's, it really depends on, you know, the, the deeper you go, the, the less frequently you want to do it. Yeah. But it, and it does have the benefit, doesn't it, of making the products go in, that you're using, go in deeper. Um, okay. Yeah, it does. And I think it's a nice, you know, one of the things that I do it for, I didn't do it today because it's 7 a.m. my time, but for when I'm doing like public speaking and things and I want to like look, you know, really fresh and, and young or whatever, I will sometimes just do like a home derma roller right beforehand um, because it does kind of plump up your skin a little bit. It makes yeah. you look, you know, a little bit more alive and vibrant and glowing. And, um, and then you get out there and you have your photo shoot or your, you know, your social gathering or whatever it is. And um, I think it, for, at least for me, I think it makes you just, just look a little bit more happy and alive. <laughs> yeah, it's the blood flow, doesn't it? And I, I find I go a bit red after I've done it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, oh, that's a great tip. So, you, um, in terms of skin, you've been sharing a lot on your Instagram recently, and I know that you've been over to South Korea as well and done some research there. So, looking now at at home stuff that people can do, um, what are the best things for? I mean, men and women. I think men have slightly thicker skin, right? So. <laughs> I don't necessarily think they maybe need to spend quite as much um, on, on their skincare, but you might have a different opinion. But certainly for women who it really, you know, they care about their skin and, and why not? It makes them look good, feel good. What would be your top tips in terms of what to look for for at home skincare? So the first thing is to find a good sunblock. And I think that most people know this, most women at least know this at this point, but you know, you should be putting on sunblock every single day. And, by, and sunblock is different than sunscreen. You know, sunblock is basically like the mineral sunblocks that are gonna prevent the, it actually physically blocks the sun from getting into your skin that's not getting, that the sunblock itself is not a chemical base, so it's not getting absorbed into your body. Um, so finding a good sunblock is, is really important. Wearing it every single day, whether you think you need it or not, um, is important. Uh, you know, I have a lot of patients who are sort of biohacker type, types who love the sun, and they're like, well, the sun is so good for me, and it is, uh, but it's also the number one cause of aging in your skin. Mm -hmm. It's the number one cause of oxidative damage and, and wrinkles, and, and so photo aging is the number one thing, so stopping that is important. Um, yeah, I was going to just ask you on that because what about yeah. the fact that you should, you know, go out for maybe 15 to 20 minutes without a sunscreen so that you're getting and you're topping up, you're making enough vitamin D. What are your thoughts? 
Yeah, I'm, I, I absolutely am pro sunlight. You know, I just, I just think that maybe not so much on your face. If yeah. that's something you want to protect, um, you know, go out with your shirt off and, or put your, you know, go out with in some shorts and go, you know, you can go out naked and put a hat on your head. <laughs> but, you know, if you care, if, if your face is, if your skin is that important to you, then, then protecting it from sun is important. Mm -hmm. um, but there's actually, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a huge Swedish study, you probably know about it, where they found that people who don't get any sun or who get very limited sun, because of, uh, of sunscreens and sunblocks or just you know, resistance to sun, they actually have uh, increased risk of overall mortality uh, mm -hmm. that's similar to long-term long, long smokers. So lack of sun is its own risk factor for yeah. cardiovascular disease, all kinds of cancers, you know, all diabetes, all kinds of things. So sun is important. And I would never tell people never to get sun. I would just say, protect the things that, that need protecting and, and are exposed to the sun all the time. You just don't realize it, you know, in your car, when you're driving, when you're mm -hmm. sitting in your house next to a window, you know, there's so many times where your face is actually being exposed to the sun that you're just not even thinking about it. So you, your face doesn't need any more sun, if you ask me. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Well, I actually wear a mineral sunscreen every day. I just put it on religiously every day. Cause yeah, me yeah. too. You do. Um, so that's a big one. And then after that, it, there's so many, there's so many products out there right now. Um, some of the best studied products for, uh, for anti-aging purposes are uh, retinoids. So a good retinoid. Um, and there are a number of different good ones that you can get that are over the counter um, or you can get them through physician offices. But retin a ret good retinoid is really going to help to just keep your the cells in your skin regenerating and, and releasing collagen and, and keep that sort of cell cycle going. Um, they can be kind of irritating. So that's one of the things with retinoids. You want to start kind of slow, maybe apply it a couple of times a week or mix it with a, you know, your moisturizer. Um, because if you if it's if you're not used to it, it can cause a lot of redness, swelling, you know, irritation, things like that. Um, other things there's just known to be good for skin are things like vitamin C, vitamin E, um, some of the antioxidants. Hyaluronic acid, of course, is is great for skin. That's just going to be essentially plumping up uh, your skin because we lose that uh, as we age. And so those are some of the things that are that are great. Um, but yeah, I mean, on, like on my Instagram, I talk about there's so many new there's new peptides that are coming out all the time. Um, there are new, you know, I would I just did a, one of my the one thing on Instagram I did was the the a salmon sperm DNA facial that I had in South Korea. I don't know if you saw that one. No. But I got, oh my God. I got, yeah, it was, it was salmon sperm. Crazy. It was salmon sperm DNA and I, and I got, and so in South Korea right now, salmon sperm DNA is one of the like just hot items. And so okay. I was just there uh, doing some kind of some traveling and some research and like everywhere you go, there's like injectable forms of this. There's um, like as almost like filler or um, to increase cellular production. Um, and then there are all of these facials that you can get that have that have salmon sperm DNA in them. So I had one <laughs> when I was in, in South Korea. There were, and I did a post about it. And everyone, of course, you know, sent me all kinds of messages about it. Even my friends now, they just call me sperm, you know, sperm face. Sperm face. <laughs> yeah. but, uh, but it's really just the, it's the DNA. And basically, it acts kind of in a similar way to PRP, um, from what I can tell from reading the studies, that the DNA in that, that sperm is basically activating some of the same cellular healing and processes that, that like a platelet-rich plasma would do, um, but just in a different way. And this was what, like a salmon sperm mask that you had put on? Or? <laughs> yeah, it was a mask. And, but it, actually, they have they have a skincare um, that the spa that I was at, which is the Shang Pri Spa, which is one of the more famous spas there. They actually have a, a line um, of skincare that you can buy, and you take it home and you do this. This it's like this salmon sperm DNA that you. Put on your face. Like, you know, like? It's, it's like a serum. It smelled good. It, it does sound like it wouldn't smell good, but it wasn't. It wasn't <laughs> gross. <laughs> but yeah, it's a big thing there. Um, and there's some there's some data behind it. Uh, something else that was big there is snail mucin. So the, the slime from snails is okay. a big thing in South Korea. And there's not as much data behind that, but it is, it's in like all of, you know, all their face masks and things like that. So there's some wacky stuff going on. <laughs> yeah, there is. Um, it definitely is. And what about, um, I know there's kind of some debate in terms of collagen that you put on your skin cannot necessarily replicate, obviously your body's got to produce <clears throat> collagen and things right. like elastin. And I seem to read varying research, obviously collagen, there are certain ways and nutritionally you can support the production of it. And then I read a study that said with elastin, elastin just declines over time and there's really not much you can do and just hope that your parents didn't destroy your elastin <laughs> by putting things like sun cream on you as a child. How much of that yeah. is true? What's your kind of view on that? 
Yeah, I mean, there is some, there is, there are some studies with collagen with taking it orally, at least that that you know point to having improvements in skin and hair. But it's not because it all you know you don't take it in and then all of a sudden it just goes to your skin. Like obviously it's it's a big protein, so essentially it gets broken down into the amino acids. And if you happen to be short on those amino acids, then you can use them to make your own collagen. So I do think it's a little confusing because it's not necessarily the call. It's not like you're taking it in collagen and all of a sudden you you just have more of it and it's just being put to use immediately. It has to be made into protein and then that gets made into use. Um, most of the collagens for that you apply topically, like you said, are they're too big. Like if it's an actual collagen particle, it's not gonna penetrate the skin barrier. There are some formulations that I've seen that have, uh, have tried to address that problem by, by making you know, little peptides, these little short protein change, chains that are collagen-esque uh, proteins that, that may get absorbed by the skin. Uh, but you know, honestly, it's, it's really hard, even for someone who's in this field, who, you know, who reads all the things and, and has all of the products uh, to tell what's, what's real and what's not. Because with skincare products, it's going to take a good you know, two or three months of using something to know if it's doing anything. Mm -hmm. uh, even then, there's such a, there's a, such a placebo effect you know, oftentimes because you're paying a lot of money for it. And you're like, well, I'm sure it's working. Look how beautiful I look. Um, um, and so it's really hard to to look at the the data and, and such. But I think I think making sure you're getting enough amino acids, uh, whether you're taking it as a collagen or not, is important for skin. Um, and then I do and, and hyaluronic acid and collagen can be applied topically if they're small enough particles. If they're small enough. Well, your skin looks amazing. So I'm pretty sure that what you're doing is right. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> And um, in terms of, yeah, so hyaluronic acid is good for hydration, right? Because it holds a thousand times its weight in water. Yes, exactly. Exactly a thousand times. And that's something, so as, you know, starting at about age 25, as you alluded to, we, we stop, we don't stop completely, but you start making less and less collagen, hyaluronic acid and elastin. So elastin is what gives your skin the bounce back like a rubber band. Collagen is what gives it structure. Hyaluronic acid is what gives it the water retaining abilities. Uh, so that gets worse and worse after the age of 25. At the same time, as you're making less and less of those things, your body's also breaking down more and more of them because you have, you know, continued increased uh, sun exposure, increased chemical exposure in the environment, increased you know, toxins in your foods, et cetera. So you're, you're making less, you're breaking down more. And, and that of course leads to just looking older faster than yeah. you want to. Yeah, sure. And, and um, sugar is bad, right? Because of glycation. Sugar um, is very bad. Sugar, I think, is one of the worst things you can do for your skin, your hair, or your sexual organs um, because, yeah, glycation in skin, essentially, it gets in there and it breaks down the collagen. The collagen is this very structured, you know, organism in your skin, not organism, but structure in your skin, and that the glycation from sugar just gets in there and just mucks it up. It, like, just makes it this messy goop, uh, and all of a sudden, the structure kind of falls apart. So, it's, sugar is, is awful for your skin. Mm, interesting. And what are your thoughts on... Um, Resveratrol, we know that that's good for anti-aging and kind of mimicking the same things you get from fasting, but what's your thoughts in terms of using skincare products that contain resveratrol? There aren't that many, but I know some, some brands do put it in. Yeah, you know, I've seen them and I don't know, I don't have enough data to know how effective they are. There's so many things with skin that's difficult. For one thing, you know, whether or not it's penetrating into the skin, you know, is important because a lot of skincare products, they have amazing things in them, but we don't actually know if they're getting into the skin itself because that skin barrier is, is so good at keeping things out. That's, you know, its whole job. Um, I think the idea of a resveratrol skin product is a, is a great one. Um, maybe, maybe next thing we're going to have, actually, I saw a study recently where they were looking at, um, at I had a rapamycin skin trial. Have you seen that? You know, so rapamycin is also, you know, David Sinclair's book. I was just reading another article about that. So, you know, it's sort of this, uh, we know it's going to, it's, it, it seems to be a very good uh, anti-aging drug, even though it's uh, not used a lot currently, but they did a trial with rapamycin applied topically in skin and, and did see definite skin improvements over time, um, which makes sense because you can limit it, you know, just the skin and inhibit uh, some of the, the cellular uh, problems that you're going to have, then it would work. So I think resveratrol is probably similar. Um, I haven't seen any metformin to the skin studies yet, but who knows? All of these things, maybe can just be topical. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and what about in terms of, like, we take our bodies to the gym, effectively. What, what are your thoughts on facial exercises in terms of, you know, there's a big migration isn't there southwards as we age right and that is that something that can help and you know people put fillers in and things and you know they use botox but what can you do can you do exercises to help maintain that 
Um, you know, I've seen, I've, I've looked into that and tried and like some of the like micro, that some of the current, you know, microcurrent therapies and things mm -hmm. like that where you're stimulating muscles. Um, I haven't been completely convinced that it helps a lot. I certainly don't think it's going to hurt. I mean, if you, mm -hmm. if you have a way to work your muscles, but what happens over time um, is not necessarily that the muscles get weaker. I mean, that does happen, but a lot of it is that there's, there's actually a shifting in your facial structure. So you have your bones in your face, for instance, uh, they actually change. So you get widening for, of, your, of your orbital bones. So instead of being this big, they get this big. Same thing happens with your nose. It, they basically, all of these like holes in your face get bigger. Um, the bones actually change. And then the fat is yeah. gonna change, you know, the fat moves. So you have, instead of having fat pads up here, the fat pads move down here. Yeah. And so, you know, exercises are not gonna change those things. Um, and you know, frankly, most of the things that we do are not gonna change those things. That's just sort of part of, part of aging. But um, you know, I, I don't think it's gonna hurt you, but I'm not sure how much benefit you'll see from it. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Um, interesting. And so in terms of your top tips for women, okay, um, to basically look and feel younger, if you could kind of give them the top five things they should do, what should they do? Oh, my goodness. Um, top tips. I mean, the first one is, is basically just be healthy, you know, eat healthy, avoid sugar, exercise, um, meditate, all the things that we know are important are, are, are completely important for your skin, for your hair, for sex, you know, for everything. Um, you'll age much slower if you do all of those things. Okay. Um, I think that there is, um, you know, all the toys that we have, the light therapy, the, the shockwave therapy, the stem cells, you know, all of that can help. But the most important thing that you can do is, you know, look at what, look at what you're, you're putting in your mouth and look at what your body's doing on a daily basis. Um, and then certainly, like, like I said, uh, the sunblock is really important. Um, I think that, I think that, you know, state of mind and, and sort of mental health and, and, um, sort of mindfulness and, and being in the present is actually more important than a lot of us think, you know, we, there's, there's tons of studies, obviously at this point, um, at the, at the connection between mental health and physical health. And I think that but despite that, I think that most people, a lot of people still don't really believe it. Um, but I, I've seen it, you know, in myself and in my patients that, that if you, when you change your mindset, you actually can change so many other things about your, your body that you don't that you don't even know you can change. Um, and then, you know, for skin, uh, I think doing something like uh, some kind of maintenance treatment that's pretty easy, like, like a microneedling treatment, you know, at a clinic every couple of months is great for your skin. It's, it's relatively inexpensive and you're continuing to get that skin production, um, investing in some good skincare products that are not, you don't need to be like super, super high expensive ones, but do some research and get, get some products that are, um, are known to be effective and, and just apply them every day and make sure you're pretty regimented about your skincare uh, regimen, because it does make a difference. It, you know, what you put on your skin, uh, as well as what you put in your body, obviously makes a big difference as well. Mm, yeah, for sure. Thank you. And what about some women I know really, um, battle with, I suppose the two biggest things would be breakouts um, and things like rosacea. Mm -hmm. um, is there a way of, I mean, the breakouts presumably come down to hormones, but they're always fluctuating in women, aren't they, through their right. cycle? Have you got any tips on that front in terms of avoiding that? Yeah, I mean, the, the breakouts can be from anything from hormonal changes, like you say, to diet. You know, again, people who have a high sugar diet, sometimes you can have more breakouts uh, to stress. And there's so many things that can cause breakouts. Um, some of my favorite things to do for women is, you know, aside from, so first of all, you want to have hormones checked. If you have, if you have high testosterone levels, um, then, and, you're, and that's being converted uh, to this hormone called DHT, then that can be a reason for breakouts, especially in women who have like polycystic ovarian uh, syndrome and things like that. But so hormones, it checked is important to kind of get those balanced. Um, I also like uh, blue light therapy. So just like we talk about red light therapy for skin rejuvenation, the blue light therapy is actually good for uh, killing the bacteria in the skin and to, to can decrease acne flare-ups. Um, there are also a number of lasers that can be used the dermatologists have and, and medical medical spas that are they're you know they're not um they don't leave you looking crazy or too red but essentially you can get this very fast laser treatment occasionally that can help to decrease and minimize further breakouts by killing those bacteria in there as well um, there's also some some research that's been done it's not there's not a ton yet but i'm using 
something like a CBD topically uh, to decrease inflammation and to help with breakouts. Um, and that's, I think, still kind of early stages, but I've at least heard some anecdotal reports about that. Um, and then again, watching your diet, watching your sugar intake, you know, really being careful. You know, some people are, are sensitive, obviously, to things like gluten or soy or dairy or, or sugar. And so I have a lot of patients that I'll put them on a like an elimination diet where I get, you get rid of all, you know, all the things that are most commonly uh, problematic for skin uh, and for allergies and for sensitivities. And we get rid of all of them at one time for several weeks and we see what happens. And then you start adding things back in and you see what happens. Cause you know, it, maybe it's that you have a, a corn sensitivity and you have no idea and you wouldn't know it until you got rid of corn for several weeks. It takes time. Um, and all of a sudden your skin is clearing up or dairy. Dairy is a really common one for skin problems is people don't realize they have a sensitivity to dairy and all of a sudden, you know, they stop it and they're like, Oh wow, my skin looks amazing. Um, so food is a big one also. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've, Food is a big one on that. And um, so kind of just to close there, in terms of your, are there supplements that you yourself take that you um, take on a daily basis or intermittently that you think are amazing for looking and feeling younger? So I take, um, I take some of the ones that sort of the known longevity supplements. I take resveratrol. Um, I take um, like an NMN, which is an NAD precursor uh, as well. And then I take magnesium magnesium, which I think is just good in general for most people. Uh, I don't have anything that I take specifically for skin. I do for, uh, I take a nitric oxide booster, which uh, the one I take is Neo 40, which I have no association with, but that's, a, it's a great brand in the US. It's called Neo 40, N-E-O, and then the number 40. It's by a researcher named uh, Nathan Bryan, who has done a, quite a bit of work in nitric oxide research. And um, so that's my, that's kind of my go-to nitric oxide support. So for men and women, uh, but especially for men who have any kind of sexual dysfunction, that's my, that's my go-to, but really anyone over the age of 40 probably could use something like that. Um, that helps with, you know, everything from sexual performance to gym performance and, and other things. Um, so that's a favorite of mine. Um, and everything else I take, you know, I take an omega-3 if I'm not eating a lot of fish, usually mm -hmm. that, and that's, that's known, you know, obviously it's going to be good for skin also, because you mm -hmm. need that, that those good healthy fats for your skin as well. Um, and everything else I take is kind of, I, I kind of, it's kind of comes and goes, you know, I'll try things for a few months, see if they make a difference in kind of how I feel. And if not, then I chuck it and try something else. Try something else, play around. And do you think there's supplements that you can take for hair growth? Because there's so many on the market. Um, yeah. You know, do they? I think that there's, you know, there is some research behind um, some of the bigger band, brands like Nutrafol and um, Viviscal. Both are two hair supplement brands that I'm familiar with that they, they've done some, I've seen at least some white papers on them. And, and you know, I think that the ca it depends on what's causing the hair dose, mm -hmm. the hair loss for one thing. So for instance, if your hair loss is because you are super stressed out and you have all these, you know, high cortisol levels and, and such like, which is what the cause of a lot of female hair loss is, then taking something like Nutrafol, which has a lot of adaptogenic herbs in it that might help kind of balance out your cortisol could be effective. Mm -hmm. um, but if your hair loss is from male pattern baldness, maybe that's not going to work for you. Maybe what you need is to block the, the DHT hormone at the, at, you know, at the hair follicle. And that's more like a topical, different kinds of topicals. So I think part of it really depends on what's causing your hair loss. But yeah, I would say the two biggest ones that I've seen used and have had the best results with are those two brands for hair. And on the resveratrol, you're taking that presumably in high doses, right? Because often what we'll see is in, in milligrams, are you taking it kind of like a gram a day or? Yeah, I think that mine's a gram a day. I think I just checked into that. Um, and you know, that's all, it's all, it's hard because even, even people, I was at a conference recently at, at Exponential Medicine and, and David Sinclair was there and he was in my small group and I got to sit next to him and I have a total crush on him. So it was so fun. Um, but he was, <laughs> I was sitting next to him and we were all talking about, you know, resveratrol and everyone was asking him like, well, what's like, what brand do you recommend? And he makes a very big point about not recommending any brands because he's like, you know, people always take my name and attach it to their brand and say, this is, you know, recommended by David Sinclair. And he's like, it never is because I don't, I don't make recommendations. Um, but it's tricky because, there's so many uh, sort of false profits out there in the supplement world, you know, things they're, they're promising um, an X amount of resveratrol and they don't actually have it. Um, so I do think it's really hard uh, to find good brands unless you really know the industry well and, and have actually met the people who are doing the different, different types of brands. Yeah, I agree. And on the NMN, um, you take that as well. Is that, is that something you take orally, intranasally? 
Um, yeah, that's oral, um, and I've taken a, as a pill, and I'm just now switching over to a, a liposomal um, a immersion, emulsion kind of therapy for NMN um, by Quicksilver, because I'm friends, again, I'm friends with the, the oh. doctor who is part, you know, I know Chris Shea, who does, who's the, the mad scientist behind it, and it's one of those things, like, if I know the person, and I know how diligent they are, then I trust it much more than if it's just some random, you know, supplement that I buy off of, you know, Amazon. Is there a resveratrol supplement that you've, you mentioned the Quicksilver for NMN and I saw your um, story post about that, but is there a resveratrol one that you feel confident that is a good one? Or there isn't, there, I can't, I can't say on resveratrol um, what, I, mean, I don't know is the answer to that mm -hmm. one. I've had a few people give me recommendations, but I don't have any personal attachments to, or, you know, knowledge of any of the companies mm -hmm. that are making resveratrol right now. Um, but but I am still researching that because I don't want to just be taking something that's, you know, not actually doing anything. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. Exactly. Um, well, that was amazing. Thank you. You shared so much there and I will link to all of this in the show notes. Where can people, I mean, you share a lot on your Instagram um, on there. That's uh, Amy, is it Dr. Dr. Amy B. Killen is my Instagram. Amy yes. Killen is your Instagram and your website as well. Where else can people find you? Yeah, so Dr. Amy Killen is my one of my websites. I have many, but that's one of them. That's probably the easiest one to get to. Um, and then Instagram. And I'm also on Facebook as well, uh, but, but probably Instagram and then my website. If people have questions, um, then that's where to go. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming on. Thank you. This has been so fun. And you, I, I, you, you were like knew everything. So it's amazing to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's because you put so much good content out there, Amy. So thank you. <laughs> definitely check out your Instagram. Thank you so much. All right. Have a good day.